Senator is recognized as if it is in morning business without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, as a member of the Senate Environmental Committee and also uh, on the Energy Committee, uh, it is my view that the time is long overdue for Congress to go beyond deal-making and politics as usual in addressing the crisis of global warming. The droughts, the floods, the severe weather disturbances that our planet is already experiencing will only get worse, potentially impacting billions of people if we do not take bold and decisive action in the very near future. While the Lieberman-Warner cap-and-trade bill is a strong step forward, and I applaud both senators, and I applaud Senator Barbara Boxer for her entire leadership on global warming, it is my view that that legislation, as currently written, does not go anywhere near far enough in creating the policies that the scientific community says we must develop in order to avert a planetary catastrophe. This legislation is also lacking in paving the way for the transformation of our energy system away from fossil fuels into energy efficiency and sustainable energy technologies. Here are some of my concerns about the Lieberman-Warner bill. And these are concerns that I will be working on in the next number of weeks trying to improve that bill. First, virtually all of the scientific evidence tells us that at the least, at the least, we must reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80 percent by the year 2050 if we stand a chance to reverse global warming. Unfortunately, the Lieberman-Warner bill, as currently written, under the very best projections, provides a 63 percent reduction. In other words, under the best pro projections, this bill does not go far enough, according to the scientific community, in giving us a chance to reverse global warming. Secondly, this legislation allows major polluters to continue emitting greenhouse gases for free until the year 2036. In fact, old-fashioned, dirty coal-burning plants could still be built during this period, and that is wrong. The right to pollute should not be given away for up to 26 years. Further, in calculating emission reductions, this bill relies much too heavily, in my view, on quote-unquote offsets, a process which is difficult to verify and which could lead to the underreporting of emission reductions. Third, this bill provides a massive amount of corporate welfare to industries which have been major emitters of greenhouse gases while requiring minimal performance standards and accountability for these same industries. According to a recent report published by Friends of the Earth, the auction and allocation processes of the bill could generate up to $3.6 trillion, $3.6 trillion over a 40-year period. While a large fund does exist in the bill for quote-unquote low-carbon technology, there is no guaranteed allocation for such important technologies as wind, solar, geothermal, hydrogen, or for energy efficiency. But there is a guaranteed allotment of $324 billion over a 40-year period for the coal industry through an advanced coal and sequestration program and $232 billion for the auto industry for advanced uh, technology vehicles. The time is late, and if Congress is serious about preventing irreversible damage to our planet because of global warming, we need to get our act together. We need to move in a bold and focused manner. And not only are the people of our country looking to us to do that, but so are countries all over the world. And Mr. President, the good news is we can do it. As you will recall, in 1941, 
President Roosevelt began, and the Congress began the process of rearming America to defeat Nazism and Japanese imperialism. Within a few short years, we had transformed our economy and we started producing the tanks and the bombs and the planes and the guns that we needed in order to defeat Nazism. We did it. We did it because of the leadership of Roosevelt and the United States Congress. In 1961, President Kennedy called upon our nation to undertake the seemingly impossible task of sending a man to the moon. Working with Congress, NASA was greatly expanded. The best scientists and engineers in this country and in the world were assembled to focus on this task. Billions of dollars were appropriated, and in 1969, as we all remember with great pride, Neil Armstrong stepped foot on the moon. We did it. There was a challenge. We stepped up to the plate, and we did it. As a result of global warming, the challenge we face today is no less daunting and no less qu consequential, quite the contrary. Now we are fighting for the future of the planet and the well-being of billions of people in every corner of the world. And once again, in my view, if we summon up the political courage, I have absolutely no doubt that the United States of America can lead the world in resolving this very, very dangerous crisis. We can do it. In that context, let me take a moment to suggest some of the ways that we can strengthen the Lieberman-Warner bill, and I look forward to working with both of those senators and the entire committee to aggressively reverse global warming. Most importantly, in my view, significant resources in this bill must be explicitly allocated for energy efficiency and sustainable energy, the areas where we can get the greatest and quickest bang for the buck. In terms of energy efficiency, my home city of Burlington, Vermont, and I have the honor of having been mayor of that city from 1981 to 1989, despite strong economic growth, that city, Burlington, Vermont, consumes no more electricity today than it did 16 years ago because of a successful citywide effort on the part of our municipally owned electric company to make our homes, our offices, our schools, buildings all over the city more energy efficient. That's what we did in Burlington, Vermont. In California, which has a strong and growing economy, Electric consumption per person there has remained steady over the last 20 years because of that state's commitment to energy efficiency. In other words, in Burlington, Vermont, in the state of California, and I'm sure in other communities around the country, despite economic growth, the consumption of electricity does not have to go soaring if we invest in energy efficiency, if we rally the people to not waste energy. Numerous studies, Mr. President, tell us that by retrofitting older buildings and by establishing strong energy efficiency standards for new construction, we can cut fuel and electric consumption by at least 40 percent. You want to save energy? That's how we do it. Those savings will increase with such new technologies as LED light bulbs, which consume one tenth of the electricity of an incandescent bulb while lasting 20 years. And these LED light bulbs are on the verge of getting on the market. We have got to facilitate that process and get them all over this country as soon as we possibly can. In terms of saving energy and transportation, it is beyond my comprehension that we are driving automobiles today which get the same mileage per gallon, 25 miles per gallon, as cars in this country did 20 years ago. Think of all of the technology, all of the changes. We are driving cars today which get the same mileage per gallon as was the case 20 years ago. That is absurd. 
If Europe and Japan can average over 44 miles per gallon, we can do at least as well. Simply raising CAFE standards to 40 miles per gallon, less than the Europeans, less than the Japanese, will save more oil than we import from Saudi Arabia. How about that? I think that makes a lot of sense. Further, we should also rebuild, be rebuilding and expanding our decaying rail and subway systems and making sure that energy efficient buses are available in rural America so that travelers have an alternative to the automobile. I think everybody knows that the state of our rails, rail system in America today is absolutely unacceptable, way beyond Europe, way beyond uh, Japan. Subways in large cities need an enormous amount of work. In rural states like Vermont, there are communities that have virtually no public transportation at all. We have got to address that crisis and that issue if we are serious about global warming. In terms of sustainable energy, the other area that we can make tremendous leaps forward, wind power is now the fastest growing source of new energy in the world and in the United States. But we have barely begun to tap its potential. In Denmark, for example, 20% of the electricity in that country is produced by wind. We, as a Congress, should be supporting wind energy not only through the creation of large wind farms in the appropriate areas, but through the production of small, inexpensive wind turb turbines, which can be used in homes and farms all across rural America. These small turbines can produce up to half the electricity that an average home consumes and are now, right now, forget the future, today are reasonably priced without federal tax credits, which are available, without rebates, such as what is being done in California today. A 1.8 kilowatt turbine is now being sold for some $12,000, including installation, with a payback of five to six years. That is a pretty good deal. And if you're not worried about global warming, if you're not worried about carbon emissions, it is a good deal because you're going to save money on your electric bill. The possibilities, Mr. President, for solar energy are virtually unlimited. In Germany, a quarter of a million homes are now producing electricity through rooftop photovoltaic units, and the price per kilowatt is rapidly declining. In California, that state is providing strong incentives so that one million homes will have photovoltaic rooftop units in the next 10 years. But the potential for solar energy goes far beyond rooftop photovoltaic units. Right now, in the state of Nevada, a solar plant is generating 56 megawatts of electricity. So what we are now beginning to see developed in the southwestern part of our country are solar plants which are capable of producing enormous amounts of electricity. According to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory of the United States Department of Energy, and I quote, solar energy represents a huge domestic energy resource for the United States, particularly in the southwest where the deserts have some of the best solar resource levels in the world, end of quote. Not end of quote, I'm sorry, quote continues. For example, an area approximately 12% the size of Nevada, 15% the federal lands in Nevada, has the potential to supply all of the electric needs of the United States, end of quote. Now, whether or not that area can, in fact, supply all the electric needs of the United States, I don't know, but I have recently in the last couple of weeks, talk to people who are involved in these solar plants, and they say that in the near future, the reasonably near future, they can supply 20% of the electricity that our country needs. There it is, sitting there, ready to happen. Our job is to facilitate that process and make it happen sooner than later. Mr. President, perhaps most significantly, 
Pacific Gas and Electric, which to my understanding is the largest electric utility in the country based in California, has recently signed a contract with Solel, an Israeli company, to build a 535 megawatt plant in the Mojave Desert. This plant, which should be operating in four years, my understanding is they're going to break ground in two, it should be operating in four years, will have an output equivalent to a small nuclear power plant and will produce electricity for some 400,000 homes. This is not a small-time operation. And the people that I talk to involved in this industry say this is just the beginning. And think of what we can do if we provided them with the support that they need. Most importantly in this discussion, people say, well, that's a good idea, but unfortunately this electricity is probably going to be sky high, very, very expensive. Mr. President, that is not the case. The price of the electricity generated by this plant to be online in four years is competitive with other fuels today, today, and will likely be much cheaper than other fuels in the future. News reports indicate that the 25-year purchase agreement signed by Pacific Gas and Electric with Solel calls for electricity to be initially generated at about 10 cents a kilowatt with very minimal increases over the next 25 years. Minimal increases. Because this is a process that does not have all that many moving parts. There it is. It needs maintenance. It needs work. But unlike gas, unlike oil, you're not looking at a volatile market. There is the sun. It will shine. So we're talking about a price over a 25-year period, which probably will end up being less than 15 cents a kilowatt in the year 2035, which I suspect will be not only very competitive, it will be more than competitive. Mr. President, the potential for solar plants in the Southwest is extremely strong. While there certainly is no magical silver bullet in the production of new non-polluting energy sources, experts tell us that we can build dozens of plants in the Southwest and that this one non-greenhouse gas emitting source could provide a huge amount of the electricity that our country needs. Mr. President, geothermal energy is another source of sustainable energy that has huge potential. As you know, geothermal energy is the heat from deep inside the earth. It is free, it is renewable, and it can be used for electricity generation and direct heating. While geothermal is available at some depth everywhere, it is most accessible in western states where hydrothermal resources are at shallow depths. Currently, the U.S. has approximately 2,900 megawatts of installed capacity, which is just 5%, 5% of the renewable electricity generation in the U.S. The installed geothermal capacity is already expected to double in the near term with projects that are under development, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. A recent report from the U.S. Department of Energy by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, suggests that Theo geothermal could provide 100,000 megawatts of new carbon-free electricity at less than 10 cents per kilowatt hour, comparable to cost for clean coal. Drilling technology from the petroleum industry is the key to unlocking this huge potential. Enhanced geothermal systems tap energy from hot impermeable rocks that are between two and six miles below the Earth's crust. So geothermal is another opportunity for us as a nation to be producing large, large amounts of energy in a way that does not emit carbon dioxide and that does not, does not create greenhouse gases. Mr. President, an investment of $1 billion, less than the price of one coal-fired power plant could make this resource commercially viable within 15 years. 
The potential payoff is huge. It is estimated that electricity from geothermal sources could provide 10 percent of the U.S. base load energy needs in 2050. In terms of the future, Mr. President, in, in terms of the future of our planet, the bad news is that scientists are now telling us that they have underestimated the speed and destructive aspects of global warming. As you'll remember, Mr. President, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which recently won the Nobel Peace Prize along with former President Al Gore, former Vice President Al Gore, uh, many of those scientists are now saying that their projections were too conservative, that the planet is warming faster than they had anticipated, and that the damage will be greater if we do not move boldly to reverse it. That's the bad news. There is good news, however. And the good news is that at the end of the day, we know how to reverse global warming. We know what to do. What is lacking now is not the scientific knowledge, although more and more knowledge will come, and it's not the technology, although more and more technology will be developed and sustainable energy will become less and less expensive. But after all is said and done, we know what we have to do. We know how to make our homes and our transportation systems more energy efficient. And we are now making great progress in driving down the cost of non-polluting sustainable energy technologies. That's what we're doing. What is lacking now is the political will, the political will to think outside of the box, the political will to envisage a new energy system in America which is not based on fossil fuels, the political will to stand up to powerful special interests who are more concerned about their profits than about the well-being of our planet. So, Mr. President, I think not only the children, young people of our country and people all over America, but people throughout the world want this Congress to catch up to where they are. They are far ahead of where we are. And I think that if we have the courage to do the right thing here, we can reverse global warming. In the process, we can create millions of good-paying jobs we can re help restore our position in the international community as, as a country that is leading and not following on this issue of huge uh, consequence. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I uh, yield back the floor.